Today's video is a CIE IGCSE chemistry video and I'm going to be talking through my top tips for paper 6 which is the alternative to practical paper. So the first thing that I want to say is make sure you've learned your apparatus both the names and how to draw them so let's run through some now. So if I wanted to use the filtration approach for separating an insoluble solute such as sand from a solvent such as water, this is what we'd use. Try and use a ruler where possible. I am not very good at drawing as you can see. So here's my beaker, my funnel, the filter paper, what stays behind in the filter paper is known as the residue and what drains through here will be the filtrate, which in the example I've given you will be water, whereas the residue will be sand. If I wanted to use the crystallization method, let's draw out the apparatus. I'm just using these methods just to give some context to the apparatus. Here's your heat proof mat. Remember that to draw Bunsen burner, it's simply an arrow pointing upwards with the word heat underneath. Then we'll need a tripod. The little wire mesh is known as the gauze. Here's your evaporating basin. So by applying heat here, you'll drive off some of that water, leaving a hydrated crystal behind that you'll allow to cool and dry, probably on filter paper or in an oven. I'm just going to quickly show you some other apparatus. So here's your Bunsen burner again, your gauze. This time we're just showing simple distillation, which can be used to separate things like seawater from pure water, ethanol from water. Now this here, notice the shape of it, is known as a round bottom flask. We have a bung up here. You may see that sometimes with a thermometer sticking into it. This is an important piece of apparatus known as a condenser. It helps to cool down the gas from the liquid that's evaporated. So that gas down here it helps to cool it down and turn it back into a liquid. Notice that the water goes in at the bottom of the condenser and the water goes out at the top. Be prepared to draw a measuring cylinder, which is used to measure out volumes of liquid fairly inaccurately. To improve the accuracy with which you're measuring the volume of liquid out, well, I'm struggling to draw this. You could use a pipette or a burette, which remember has a tap on it. A burette is an amazing piece of apparatus. It allows you to measure volumes of liquid extremely accurately, basically to the nearest drop. Remember you use a burette in a titration So you use that burette to add either the acid or the alkali to a conical flask, which contains an indicator. And that indicator changes color when neutralization has been reached. The type of indicator you pick is quite important. You want to use one with a sharp endpoint. So basically only has two colors, e.g. phenolphthalein, methyl orange. They're both good examples. Don't use universal indicator here in a titration because remember it has a range of colors, which start at red for something which is very acidic. So around pH one goes all the way through to green, which shows a neutral solution, pH seven, and then kind of a blue shade for very alkaline solutions. So about pH 13. So do not use universal indicator in a titration. A couple of other things I want to point out is if you're asked about endothermic and exothermic reactions. Remember in an endothermic reaction, energy is taken in from the surroundings and therefore the surroundings will feel colder. 
So if there's any bit of experiment where something's getting cold and they ask you what type of reaction it is, it will be endothermic. An exothermic reaction is the opposite. Heat energy is released to the surroundings. So you'll expect those surroundings to get hot. If they ask you anything to do with heating alcohols, you want to be very careful here with a naked flame. The reason for that is that alcohols are very flammable. So if you need to heat anything safely, you want to use a water bath is a good option. Something to consider now is rates of reaction. It will vary based on what the experiment is, but a good bet is to look at the amount of reactants used. So that could be the mass of reactants used divided by a time frame such as 60 seconds, or you could look at the amount of products formed. That could be if you're looking at carbon dioxide production, you could look at it from a volume of carbon dioxide produced in a certain time frame, say 60 seconds, use something like a gas syringe to capture that carbon dioxide. But again, if it's rate, you need to be dividing it by time. So here's a good example of this. Here we have calcium carbonate reacting with something like hydrochloric acid producing carbon dioxide. And we're going to look at how much carbon dioxide is released in a certain time frame. You might also have seen that experiment using a measuring balance. And rather than looking at the volume of gas released, you look at the change in mass. Because obviously as that gas escapes out of the top of the conical flask, you'll see the mass decrease. But that only works with a really heavy MR gas like carbon dioxide, which has an MR of 44. Something like hydrogen won't work because it only has an MR of 2. And then just the graphs. Be aware of when you make a change, what sort of graph you'll expect to see. So if you were to increase the temperature involved in the rate of reaction, because you've only altered the temperature, you'd still expect the same mass of product to be produced. So be careful when you're drawing those lines. It should level out at the same point. The only difference is with a higher temperature, you'd expect a steeper gradient. And that's because the particles have more kinetic energy, so they're colliding more frequently. If you alter the concentration, this is when you'd expect to see different quantities of product produced, because a higher concentration means more particles. So in this case, you would see the differing levelling out. With a larger surface area, so for example, if you were to powder the calcium carbonate solid, Again, you'd expect to see an increased frequency of collisions. So we're going to see a steeper gradient, but because the mass of your reactants has remained the same, again, it will level out at the same point. I just want to take you through a chromatography method in case they ask you to provide one. It will be easier if they just give you drops of ink, but if they give you something like grass and they want you to look at what pigments are found in grass. Remember that your first step is to crush the sample. Always give apparatus with CIE. So we're gonna use a pestle and mortar to crush. And then we want to dissolve your sample in a solvent. And give an example of a solvent. It can be as basic as water. And then you're ready to set up your chromatogram. So here's a simple setup of your chromatogram. We have our chromatography paper, which could just be filter paper, hanging off a glass rod that's held over a beaker. The next thing is to make sure you have a reference line, which is drawn in something like pencil, because pencil is insoluble. Then you add your drop of pigment to that pencil line. Next up, you need a solvent, which sits at a level lower than the reference line. A good solvent is water, you could try ethanol. And then as the solvent soaks up the filter paper or the chromatography paper, it will take that ink or the pigment with it. And based on the number of drops, you can determine how many different colours there are in the pigment. If you're after finding an RF value, remember you do the distance travelled by the ink drop or dye divided by distance travelled by solvent.
They'll probably at some point ask you about safety. Obviously, that just depends on what the experiment is. But do look out for dangerous gases such as chlorine gas and hydrogen chloride gas. Not to be confused with hydrochloric acid. These give off horrible fumes which are toxic and therefore these experiments are best carried out inside a fume cupboard. You should always be wearing safety goggles, lab coats, using gloves if appropriate. So do think about that. Another experiment they like to ask you is about the percentage mass of a particular element in a substance. So what about the percentage by mass of zinc? We we'll use this as our example found in a sample of brass, which is an alloy made up of both zinc and copper. So we're interested in basically how much zinc is there in a sample of brass. So in your method, you want to provide a way of finding the mass of brass. So use a balance to find the mass of brass. We need to have a way of forcing one of those metals, either zinc or copper, to react in order to remove its mass from the brass. A good way of doing that is by adding excess. It needs to be excess to make sure that all the metal has reacted and we're going to use sulfuric acid here. Now remember you need to know the reactivity series and what happens if zinc is added to sulfuric acid. You make a salt zinc sulfate plus hydrogen gas, effectively removing your zinc from the brass. So now we point out that the substance, that the mixture needs heating and then filtering. And we filter to leave behind just that unreactive copper. Then we wash and dry the remaining copper, find the mass of copper, using a balance again. And to find the percentage by mass of copper in the sample, you do that final mass of copper divided by the original mass of brass times by 100. And then your last step is to find the mass is to find the percentage mass of zinc by doing 100 minus your answer from the previous step. So obviously this is a very specific example where we're interested in finding the percentage by mass of zinc in a sample of brass, but these sorts of questions come up an awful lot. Be very aware of the reactivity series, so know which of these elements will react make sure that you're adding an excess of the acid to force that zinc to fully react. And by doing that, you'll just be left, in this case, with the copper, so you can then find out the percentage by mass of copper in the sample before doing 100 minus the answer to find the percentage by mass of zinc.